Welcome to part three in our biochemical energy generation and utilization section. In this section, we will discuss the importance of another major source of energy within the body, concentration gradients. We have already seen the importance of chemical gradients in the processes of neuronal signaling and muscle contraction. In this section, we will focus on two other functions of chemical concentration gradients, starting with their use in secondary active transport processes. To begin, it's important to understand the different types of transport proteins embedded within the membrane. These include uniporters that only transfer one substance across the membrane, the voltage-gated sodium and potassium channels, used in the generation of neuronal action potentials, are good examples of this type of transporter. We have also seen an antiporter example with the sodium-potassium ATPase that transports two different molecules in opposite directions across the membrane. The final class of membrane transporters are called symporters, and they transport two molecules across the membrane in the same direction. We will see examples of all three types of transporters in this section. Note that the protein transporters can be of two types. They can be channel proteins that open up a pore and allow the passage of molecules to go through them. Or they can be carrier proteins, which bind to the target molecules and change shape to pass them to the other side of the membrane. The transport of molecules across the membrane can either be passive, moving down the concentration gradient of the substance and not requiring energy input, or it can be active, moving the substance against its concentration gradient and requiring energy input. Here we will use glucose uptake by intestinal cells as an example of these processes. The intestinal epithelial cells form a single columnar layer protecting the inside of the body from the dietary substances passing through the intestinal lumen. They overlay the connective tissue and smooth muscles and also contain access to both the bloodstream and the lymphatic systems. A closer look at the epithelial cells shows that they have tight junctions connecting them together. This prevents the movement of molecules from the intestinal lumen to the basement layer of the connective tissue. Molecules that are taken up by the diet must pass through the epithelial cells directly and be transported to the bloodstream or lymphatic system on the other side. To aid in this process, the luminal side of the epithelial cells, called the apical membrane, contain microvilli that increase the surface area of the cell and provide a sticky landing area for substances from the diet. The sodium glucose symporter is a transmembrane protein and is an example of sodium-driven secondary active transport that occurs in the epithelial cells of the small intestines. The sodium glucose symporter is found on the apical membrane of the epithelial cells or the side facing the intestinal lumen. The sodium and glucose bind to the symporter and are simultaneously both co-transported into the epithelial cells. The sodium-driven glucose symporter uses the potential free energy stored in the sodium electrochemical gradient, low sodium concentration inside the epithelial cells, established by the sodium-potassium ATPase that is embedded in the basal membrane of the epithelial cells. Therefore, sodium influx from the lumen to the epithelial cell is coupled with glucose transport. This is known as secondary active transport. The GLUT2 uniporter is found on the basal membrane of the intestinal cell, or the side facing the underlying connective tissue and vascular system. GLUT2 transports glucose from the intestinal lumen through the epithelial cell and into the bloodstream. Concentration gradients also provide the energy required for the production of ATP in the mitochondria. As we have seen, ATP is the main energy source within the body. Hydrolysis of the high-energy phosphate bonds releases large amounts of energy that are used for neuron function, muscle contraction, and other metabolic processes that we've been examining within the body. 
In fact, we essentially use our own body weight in ATP every day. How is that even possible, when only a small fraction of our body weight is made up of the ATP molecule? ATP must be continually recycled from the lower energy ADP form back into the high energy ATP form. So much energy is needed to run the human body that each ATP molecule must be recycled between 500 and 750 times per day. Take a few minutes to answer these questions. Mitochondria are unique organelles in that they are thought to originate from bacterial symbionts. They contain their own circular DNA and have a double membrane. The inner membrane, thought to have originated from the original bacterial plasma membrane, and the outer membrane, thought to have originated from the plasma membrane of the eukaryotic cell that originally engulfed it. This creates two spaces within the mitochondria, the most internal space, called the matrix, and the space housed between the two membranes, termed the intermembrane space. The mitochondria are commonly known as the powerhouse of the cell, as this is the primary site where ADP is recycled into ATP. This regeneration process is called oxidative phosphorylation. The term oxidative is used because the food molecules are fully oxidized to carbon dioxide during the process to release energy. The electrons and subsequent protons, too, are used as an energy source to regenerate the ATP molecule. ATP is regenerated through the phosphorylation process of adding a phosphate group to a molecule. In this case, the energy that is harvested from the oxidation of the food molecules, hence the term oxidative phosphorylation. Most of the oxidation reactions in the breakdown of food molecules take place in the interior of the mitochondria, called the matrix. The electrons and protons are harvested in this process through the metabolic reactions of the citric acid cycle or Krebs cycle. They are transported by carrier molecules to the inner membrane of the mitochondria. Energy carriers are organic molecules that can undergo redox reactions to shuttle electrons and protons from the matrix of the mitochondria where they are harvested in the reactions of the Krebs cycle to the inner membrane of the mitochondria, where the energy is used to phosphorylate the ADP molecule back into ATP. There are three major energy carrier molecules within the body, NADH, FADH2, and NADPH. Both NADH and FADH2 are utilized in the mitochondrial oxidative phosphorylation. Later, we will see that NADPH is essential for similar photophosphorylation processes in the chloroplasts of plants. Nicotinamide adenine dinucleotide, or NAD+, can exist as either the oxidized form or the reduced state, allowing it to easily shuttle electrons from one location to another. NAD+, can accept two electrons and one proton to form NADH. Note that NAD plus NADH is a loose binding cofactor that can bind with an enzyme and then be released to travel to another location. The flavin adenine dinucleotide contains a flavin functional group that can accept two electrons and two protons. The oxidized form is FAD and the reduced form is FADH2. In contrast with NAD plus NADH, the FAD-FADH2 cofactor is usually a tight binding prosthetic group within enzymes and cannot readily dissociate from the system. Thus, electrons and protons flowing through this system must move internally within the protein. NADP plus NADPH is very similar to the NAD plus NADH, but contains an extra phosphate group. Once the energy carriers reach the inner membrane, the electrons are delivered to a series of proton pump proteins. Using the energy of the electrons, the proton pumps move protons against their concentration gradient 
into the intermembrane space of the mitochondria. Recall that the intermembrane space is the area between the two membranes of the mitochondria, the inner membrane and the outer membrane. As the intermembrane space becomes full of protons, this creates a gradient potential. You can think of a gradient potential in a similar way that humans will use the power of water in a dam to generate electricity. The dammed water holds potential energy when there is high water in the dam. When the dam is opened in a controlled way to allow the water to flow out, the power of the dammed water moving from an area of high concentration to an area of low concentration is used to turn turbines that can generate electricity. Similarly, in the mitochondria, the protons that are concentrated in the inner membrane space also have potential energy. Energy from this proton gradient is used to produce ATP through a protein channel called the ATP synthase. When the ATP synthase is bound to ADP and a phosphate ion, the channel opens, allowing the flow of protons to move through the channel. The movement of the protons through the protein causes the protein to turn like a cogwheel or a turbine. This turning process enables ADP and the inorganic phosphate to be joined together forming ATP. The electrons that have been used to generate the proton gradient will end up reducing a molecule of oxygen into water. The oxygen supplied for this process is the oxygen that we breathe in through our lungs. Thus, the oxidative phosphorylation process is also known as cellular respiration. We will spend the next few weeks learning how carbohydrates are metabolized and contribute to this energy process.